Um, this is the welcome to the last day of past summit. Our session today will we, we've been covering kind of this topic of intelligent diagnostics throughout the summit in several sessions. Um, alas, it's too much to actually cover in one session, so we've kind of been splitting up the topics in, into 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 different um, into different sessions. So today we're going to talk about some intelligent diagnostics built in, not only diagnostics that that were built in, but why they were built in and all the motivation around, um, around the notion of intelligent database. So yes, please silence your phones. This is the customary pass. Uh, please submit your evaluations at the end. Uh, my name is Pedro Lopes. I'm a, a program manager in the SQL Server Tiger team. For those that don't know, SQL, SQL Server uh, Tiger team owns all in market versions of SQL. Um, in this case, from uh, 2012, uh, all the way to SQL 2017. And I focus primarily on the relational engine, that means whatever makes your query stick. Uh, and I enjoy specifically performance tuning and optimization. Hi, my name is Parikshit Savjani. I'm a colleague of Pedro, again a PM in Tiger Team. By virtue of being in the Tiger Team, uh, my focus areas is to make customers uh, and community successful on SQL Server, and in the process I also work Make, uh, work on making storage engine better with SQL Server. So that's my focus area uh, within storage engine. So backup, SQL OS is kind of what I look into. So let's quickly get into the agenda. So today, Pedro and I will take you through the, the automatic and intelligent diagnostics which we have built in the SQL Server code, which will also help you make your SQL Server performance much better. Now, with all the diagnostics which we have, you need good tools to analyze and quickly uh, identify the common issues which you may encounter and make your job easier. So we'll take you through some of the tools. And finally, how can you use this diagnostic information to make intelligent decisions to uh, automate some of the stuff? So we'll showcase uh, the demos to identify what are the common problems you might be, which some of the common challenges which you had encountered in in-market releases of SQL Server which is solved in uh, SQL 2016 and 2017. But in fairness, too much for one session. We've been covering this throughout the summit. Sure. Uh, we'll boil the, boil the ocean today. <laughs> Got it. So like Pedro mentioned, I think in this entire uh, summit, you have seen SQL 2016, 2017 in piecemeal approach wherein you have learned adaptive, automatic, uh, choice, and all the other. So we wanted to give you in this particular slide, before we dive into the actual session, uh, we wanted to give you a 30,000 feet overview of what 2017 release is all about. Because we in SQL Server Engineering team believes 2017 is going to be a milestone release, which you might remember for quite long in the history. So 2017 release is all about choice. Taking the SQL Server code across different platforms, Docker container, Linux, and Azure SQL managed instance. So it's the same application code being able to work across these platform and giving choice to customers, that was one focus area. And I think our engineering team has done a remarkable job in porting this code. I think sometimes we spend weeks and months of time writing scripts, uh, and here we have a millions of line of code base which was just moved across and works as is in Linux. So I think our engineering team great, did a great job there. The next set of investments which were made in 2017 is intelligent, uh, intelligent theme. And I would divide this into two sections. Uh, operational intelligence, which we'll, wherein we learn based on the query patterns and try to self-tune uh, some of the SQL server so that the performance works, I mean, it, it performs better out of the box without you having to turn on any knobs. So, uh, and exposing some of the intelligent diagnostic stuff for you to be able to uh, take intelligent decisions. And the second aspect is data intelligence, wherein using your data in the database, a developer or data scientist can perform advanced analytics inside the database. So that is our Python graph. Those capabilities are built into uh, SQL Server 26, uh, 2017. And finally, uh, with all the goodies in 2016, 2017, you are now compelled or you, you're motivated to migrate to 2016 or 2017 or Azure SQL Managed Instance. 
So what are the new tools which are available for you to be able to upgrade or migrate to SQL Server 2016, 2017, or Azure? So DMA, uh, DMS, data, uh, Database Experimentation Assistant, which allows you to perform A-B testing uh, for your performance, uh, how your workload would behave, will it regress? Uh, distributed replay was too complicated, and the, uh, DA, DEA, uh, Database Experimentation Assistant, simplifies some of that stuff. So these are, the, at a very broad level, the theme of investments which were made in 2017 by the SQL Server product team. And everything here is driven by, uh, am I using it in wrong? Yes. Yeah, Quick everything job. here is driven uh, by customers and community. I think uh, there is a huge share of community uh, in all of these in investments which we have made. All the feedback which we have been getting from the community, some of the MVPs, is all is is what we take back and put our investments into. So, undoubtedly, SQL Server has the best built-in diagnostics in the industry. Uh, if you just take your show plans, and if you have worked in lower versions of SQL Server, if you take a show plan now in 2016 or 2017. Uh, you can pretty much reconstruct or hypothesize what actually went wrong with that particular query at the runtime, with all the trace flag information, wait stats. So previously, your show plan was very much static. The amount of information which we are adding it, and then there is query store, which further allows you to capture that historical patterns of the query. That is, uh, that is what we are, and we are, we are trying to make more and more enhancements in this particular area. Performance monitoring uh, allows you to capture server diagnostic resource, uh, uh, resource monitoring and utilization on your server. The, that's what Perfmon helps you with. DMVs, uh, uh, catalog views, uh, allows you to have monitoring and alerting in place. And finally, extended events for advanced debugging, which will allow you to further uh, kind of reverse engineer and exactly know what's going on. And the good news is we have tried to maintain this across platform. As we are going across platform, we are trying to maintain the same set of tools for you to not develop new skill set for you to understand what's going wrong with the. It's the same SQL server running across different platforms. So the same tools are available for you. Uh, these troubleshooting will allow you to drill into various scenarios, uh, uh, performance, server, and that is what is the focus of this particular session. We'll go deep dive into performance and server diagnostics. For HADR, we have a, ses uh, we have a session later today, uh, which Saurabh is delivering on Always On Diagnostics. So he's going to deep dive into uh, HADR diagnostics. And these diagnostics are also fundamental building blocks for some of the tools and some of the partner tools which we have been working with. And because with the rich telemetry which we have with SQL Server, you need some of the smart tools to gather all these data together, put it together to make sense out of it. So we, we are making SSMS more smarter, and there are partner tools available who are using this telemetry information to make more smarter decisions out of the box for you. And finally, this is where SQL Server is moving. We are taking all this telemetry diagnostic data and trying to make it more automatic uh, trying to make it more intelligent and allowing you to be more proactive. That is the end goal. And we'll show you in this session how SQL Server is moving in this particular direction. So this is all about uh, diagnostics. Let's get into the meat of the session with SQL, Mr. SQL PTO talking so, about of diagnostics. Thank you. So uh, you know, we've been covering performance diagnostics throughout uh, several of our sessions uh, this week. Um, I want to uh, start by um, really laying out the differences that these changes that have gone into the product in the last year can make into how you operate, how you troubleshoot SQL Server. Um, old school kind of troubleshooting would be um, you maybe collect performance, moni performance monitor counters, you submit it to something like PAL or you analyze manually. Uh, maybe you use some DMVs and try to correlate to, uh, each other uh, manually or with some scripts that you capture from the community. Maybe you're using SQL Profiler, hopefully not today anymore. Uh, we do have 
uh, in the latest versions of SSMS, a uh, accident event profile of there, which will be incremented in the next few releases of SSMS to resemble more and more the experience of SQL Profiler. SQL Trace underneath SQL Profiler being the UI, and, um, and show plan, you would look at a query plan, estimated or actual, depending on, on the circumstances, and try to derive some insight from there. Still limited, still uh, as, as a sense of you would need to be some uh, magician performing some black voodoo of, of sorts in order to try to correlate this data and come up with educated guesses. Most of it would stem from your continued experience using all these tools as uh, ecosystem. Now, uh, what we've enabled in the past few sessions, uh, so, sorry, in the past few uh, iterations of SSMS and also the engine is new diagnostics built in to make it easier but also faster to get from the top of the funnel where you have a my server is slow kind of statement down to I can pinpoint the issue. Which, and then go on to maybe troubleshoot that using some of the tools that we've made available that provide some sort of tips and tricks and automations to try to get you to a better place if the engine doesn't do that already, because uh, in 2017 it does um, for a, a good uh, portion of pot potential issues. So extended events, we've added an extend X event profiler in the last two versions of SSMS. Uh, download a new version, it's usable all the way back to 2008 at least. We don't quite guarantee compatibility with 2005. Um, we have, for example, the performance dashboard reports that were made uh, default in SSMS, no, um, no external downloads, and this can be used again all the way back to 2008. So start, you just open up from your desktop and start using it. Uh, performance baseline reports, this is an example of how we've released to GitHub some uh, artifacts, if you will, some ways that you can, uh, that you can further increment uh, performance monitoring and performance diagnostics. That's in the Tiger Toolbox. I'll, I'll have, we'll have the link at the end in the, in the, the last uh, slide. Uh, live query stats. Yesterday, and I've, I've shown how live query stats can be very powerful. In five minutes, you'll get a call in the middle of the night saying, hey, my server is slow. You go in, you drill down, you see the actual plan that's running live, and you can start to derive insights from all the, the information we've added to the plan and you see it as it is executing. That's all made possible by engine changes. For example, lightweight, light query profiling, which is something I've also uh, talked about more uh, extensively yesterday. By the way, all our slides will be available, so I'm referencing things that I won't, we won't be talking deeply in this session, but you can go to uh, the other slides and the demos respectively and get some insight there. As always, our contact email, it's always available for questions. Um, and we've expanded query plan diagnostics. Uh, again, something I've demoed in uh, uh, Wednesday's session with Joe was, uh, again, features in SSMS like the plan analysis that will allow you to um, detect and, and analyze uh, CE differences, cardinality estimation differences, and give you clues on, hey, try this or try that in order to improve the performance of this query. So that's a number of investments we've been doing to kind of shortcut the time you need to get to a, 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 a from a, a problem to an action on that problem. And you don't need to necessarily be an advanced 400, 500 level DBA all the time. You can go from zero to hero, like what I was talking in yesterday's session, um, with using our tools to aid you in the process. And uh, by the way, SSMS, in that perspective, can be your new best friend. There's a, a lot of tools and capabilities built into S to, to SSMS uh, from a plan analysis perspective, comparing plans and whatnot. I mentioned the performance dashboards in SSMS. This is just a screenshot there. Uh, with this and being embedded into SSMS, I can connect from my laptop or desktop as a DBA to any uh, server in my estate and immediately get a glimpse of the performance status of this instance. For instance, here I can see that the CPU is quite pegged and has been for, for some minutes now. I can see that uh, by the blue bar there that most of the CPU is being taken by this SQL Server process itself, so it is uh, something I want to take care of. I even see weights there, and I have a number of other, other artifacts. So point with performance dashboard being um, there's no extra downloads. If someone used performance dashboard before, probably you needed to download and then install a schema in master. Ugh. 
and then um, you would you would perhaps not use that everywhere because you maybe you're not authorized to deploy a new schema in master in your production servers, may, even though it's a, it's a Microsoft issue uh, tool. So now no more of that, uh, just embedded into SSMS. We've also added uh, or changed the underlying historical weights um, report. Uh, before you would you would go into the report, and I remember this quite vividly. Um, if if a server is not, let's say, busy 90% of the time, you would mostly see idle weights as being the the most prevalent weight. Well, an idle weight is kind of nothing, right? So we, for example, we've uh, uh, filtered out. Uh, innocuous weights, wait, weight types that accumulate as a normal operation of the server, but don't really tell you anything. Those are filtered out from the weight stats report. But also we've categorized the weights to be easier to, 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 to understand what component are they, uh, are they influencing. For example, uh, if I see CX packet, this, is, this has to do with parallelism. If I see resource semaphore, that has to do with memory. So we've kind of tried to translate and group into families the, the weight stats. Something new there is the uh, latches page. Let's say you open this report, you go to the weights, and your most prevalent weights are latch EX. Uh, well, where is that coming from? Uh, and that you can go to the sub-report on the latches and really see the drill down of latches as they occurred historically in your server. So that's another, another uh, feature right there. One final addition, and again, this was just the first release of, of Performance Dashboard. We would very much welcome feedback as you start to use it. Hey, I would like to see this or that. Please, please, please uh, give us feedback. One of the last things we added is some more uh, uh, purposefulness into the missing index report. Why do I mean? What do I mean by that? Before you would open that sub-report, which basically uses the CVM missing index CVMV, and you see perhaps in a very busy server that's been online for a long time hundreds of, of indexes. Maybe a lot of them would be overlapping. Not quite the best scenario, right? So uh, what we've done here as a first approach is we've added a scoring method. Um, and, and we will, although we will show all the indexes that, that the MV outputs, there's a scoring there. And we have a note at the top that says, hey, please only consider indexes that at least that have this uh, score or higher. And when we say consider, it still means that you need to go in look at your current indexes and see if there's a current index you can marginally change. For example, add one extra column to the, um, to the uh, covering part, to the, the included clause of the index, instead of creating a brand new one. So it still requires you to have some, some manual uh, uh, analysis there, but at least you, you will be able to derive only the important indexes from there. And the best part is it being out of the box with SSMS. So performance dashboard by itself is nothing new. We already had it but it required previously an external installable and, and for you to run a script in MSDB. Now, most customers or most DBAs would, although it's been tested, but would not risk their job to run it uh, on your tier one mission critical box, even if it's coming from Microsoft. And we wanted to make it friction free, out of the box with SSMS. You don't have to, when you're managing large deployments of SQL Server, you don't have to run scripts on across all of them. So it works out of the box with all lower versions of SQL Server. You just need yeah, to get the new SSMS 17.2, and it just works. So, question? yes, a question there. Back, so this is contained in SSMS, which, which means that you can uh, point from your desktop that's running SSMS 17.2 or higher, point to, to SQL 2008 all the way to 2017. But this is not SQL Server 2017. So yeah. let me clarify that. Thank you for the question. So the question is, uh, do I have to install basically SQL 2017 to get this? Uh, SQL Server Management Studio does not ship with SQL Server anymore. So uh, for nine or 10 months now, SQL Server Management Studio is what we say out of band with the main product, which means that it releases standalone packages that you can find, uh, if you Google or Bing or whatever is your favorite engine, Bing for SSMS, you'll find a separate download that is not deployed with the product. Okay? And that means that also, um, you can, we will update the, the SSMS every roughly two months. So it, does, it has a rapid update because we will add features, we'll, we'll uh, fix bugs and whatnot. So uh, you don't have to wait so long 
to get improvements into the tools as you did before, that you had to wait for service packs, for example, right? So it's completely out of band. You can, you can download standalone and use whatever. Does that answer your question? Okay, there was another question here. Previously, you would have to copy, right? So you would have to copy, yes. You would have to actually copy around 20 files because those are all the, the reports plus the schema. Now what you need to do in this scenario is uh, you, don't need, you don't deploy anything into the uh, scheme of the databases, which is a concern from a uh, fundamentally a stability standpoint, if you will. If I'm managing an estate, I don't want any foreign non uh, line of business applications deploying anything you can still take the um, ssms uh, file there and that's one single file and deploy the new version of ssms in your server and use them locally for example so how could you use them before well we can we can uh, take yeah this let's, offline. let's let's take this, let's offline, take this offline. Yeah. Uh, yes another question there and then we go on Right. You don't need the internet for this. After you download and put... Yes. Yes. Excellent feedback. That, that's uh, a good it does not. Tools are not in the catalog. Um, Let's connect at the end. I would love to get that feedback directly from you in an email or something so I can run with it. That's, that's good feedback. Thank you. But I think it's a still a good problem to solve now it that is. we are bringing the improvements yes. early rather than you have to wait for the next release. We're bringing them early so you have an option. So it's still a good problem to help. Very valid feedback. And I think we'll, we'll work on that. So um, with SQL Server 27, 2017 and some of these also with 16, we start to have clever insights uh, that are modern, that are actionable, intelligent, and they, they drive you right into the action you need to take. For example, with Query Store, we've added wait stats. Uh, I've, I've demoed that yesterday. Um, we, based on Query Stats, oh, sorry, yes, based on Query Store, sorry, uh, we now also have the feature automatic tuning, which it's at this point in time, what it does is plan for action. What is it? In a nutshell, in a nutshell, what we're doing is uh, we are, uh, query store is turned on all the time, by the way, uh, that's a flight recorder of sorts, so the, the, the purpose is to be on all the time. There are obviously specific settings that you need to, to be attentive to, to have it running 24-7. We have recently updated the a page in, in the documentation named best practices with the query store, and you'll find information on how to best uh, configure it uh, for 24-7 uh, use. Anyway, going on. So it's collecting information about all the running uh, workload. And should it detect a regression in the plan shape uh, due to some change, let's say, in statistics, or uh, it was a, that was a recompilation and, and you're now using a new uh, parameter in some procedure that changed drastically the plan. The point is, we will detect there was regressions in, in, the, in a number of scenarios. And in the next few seconds after the new next few executions that the new plan is, is, is being used, we will uh, backtrack to the previous known good plan and use that one. Should it be okay, we'll continue to use it. Should it not, we roll back the change we just did. So it's kind of adaptive in that perspective. And now if you want to then get insights as to what changed this, I, have, I go to the query store, I see that, okay, uh, automatic plan reg regression correction kicked in. I have two versions of the plan. What's the difference here? We now have tools like the query plan analysis, and the, the, um, and which is embedded into SSMS, plus the plan comparison that you can pull in inside query store, and you compare the plans side by side or top bottom, whatever, um, and you'll be able to see in the UI uh, because it will guide you through it, where are the similarities, where, where are the differences, and what, what may have, give you a few hypotheses of what may have changed. 
Um, and finally, adaptive query processing. Uh, we've been, we did a, a more in-depth session on, on Wednesday on this. Again, you're welcome to go in and, and take a look at the slide deck and, and the demos, run them yourselves. But we have now embedded into, into QP a number of enhancements that we deal with uh, memory imbalances, for example. If, if you've taken too much memory, then the query users will uh, correct that in subsequent executions. If you've not taken memory enough and you're spilling, we will correct that in subsequent executions. We will use adaptive joins if you're using batch mode to make sure that you're using the optimal type of join for the number of rows you're bringing in, and that's adaptive on the fly at runtime. And a, new, a, new, uh, a number of other features within this umbrella that we call adaptive query processing. So there are a number of improvements there that you can leverage out of the box uh, that remove some of the more tedious um, uh, tasks that DBAs may have had, and then, can, can, then we, you will need to just use your skills and your attention and your time to actually uh, run more in-depth uh, analysis and, and really shine in your, in your work without having to deal with your more menial tasks, if you will, that any DBA does. I was a production DBA for years. Uh, the, on the query store specifically, like I said, it's a flight data recorder. And in a plane, no one turns off the, the, the flight data recorder, right? So it should be on all the time with the appropriate settings again. Uh, we capture queries, query plans, we capture compilation and runtime statistics, and those together with in the embedded UI uh, and some other tools in SSMS will allow you to quickly uh, identify problems. With, uh, with auto-tuning, it will even correct performance regressions in minutes or seconds um, by itself. And the scenarios it enables uh, are, are quite a few. So finding regressed queries and uh, doing some ad hoc workload optimization, this um, this is just a, a screenshot on how I see how the, the view of having the same query with two different plans. That's what the circles mean. I have plan ID one and two. And you can see that consistently, uh, plan ID two is, uh, has, consumes more resources than plan ID one. This is the kind of scenario that uh, automatic plan regression would understand and then go back to the plan that consistently behaves better uh, from any metric that you choose. You can choose a number of metrics here. So the point would be enable query store, let it collect data, and then uh, you, you either automatically or in 2016 manually, you'll be able to pinpoint and correct problems there. The way I look at query store uh, is, is it's like a digital assistant for a DBA. It's like somebody who's learning your query pattern, and it's like, hey, Cortana, Siri, can you tell me what's going wrong with my query patterns? And it tells you, hey, there's a regressed query here. Uh, I have a recommendation for you. I can tune it for you with automatic tuning. So if you can think, and it's kind of synonymous how it is. It's kind of constantly learning, identifying the regressed query pattern, and gives you, for a DBA, I feel it's like a digital assistant. Uh, Cortana that's, still doesn't connect to query store. Like OK, that. yeah. <laughs> so uh, we've, we've. There was a question. I'm yes, sorry. I'm sorry. Go on. Yes, if you leave the defaults, which you turn on query store. Yes, we have. Um, that's why we have that uh, document, Best Practices with Query Store, uh, which go into further depth on what you need to take care of, even has some settings that are different from the defaults that, we, that may fit, your mileage may vary, obviously, but may fit uh, your server uh, running 24-7. The point is, and maybe, maybe you need to enable a specific trace flag that does asynchronous load of Query Store. That's a Query Store, that's a trace flag that's documented we, we would recommend you actually to turn that on by default as a startup trace flag. Uh, it's a default actually in Azure. It will be the default in the next version of the product. So um, there are a few things you need to take care of, absolutely. But it is a flat recorder in the end. You need to tune it and then use it for your benefit, right? So thank you for so, the question there. So as a DBA, you might want to account for it and plan for it. When you're testing it, you would want to keep query store on. You, don't, you shouldn't be thinking of something of it as an overhead or I would turn it on. When you're testing your workload, we, you sh because it's, there's a lot of value to it for you to, to quickly analyze and, and quickly auto-solve some or self-tune some of the problems. So. so you see here a number of dimensions you can use in any report, in any view of Query Store. There's a number of dimensions you can explore depending on what you're looking at. I was seeing a screenshot of uh, performance dashboard before. I was seeing my CPU was spec, correct? Well, I have Query Store turned on, I can go in and I can, for example, select the, the metric of CPU time. 
uh, and I can, or DOP, depending if I'm seeing a lot of parallelism weights. And I can pinpoint my top heavy hitters in those dimensions and then quickly right there see the plan and do some analysis in line. So it really enables the production DBA to see this data uh, live and, and use this flight data recorder to take uh, either prevent preemptive measures going forward because a, a certain problem has been observed, or, or B, even do some proactive uh, um, uh, analysis of how is your workload faring in this server and do I have anything that I need to take care of? Yes, question there. So the question is, does a query store, uh, is, there, is query store able to surface and correlate uh, changes you've done to the system that may impact the, the shape of the plans and the quality of the plans? It does not. So here's the thing. Uh, a DBA is not out of work. A DBA needs to do that part. So what query store now enables, let's say in 2016 still, it collects all that data. It provides some visuals that will, and even tools like the plan analysis and whatnot that will take it to a certain point and give you hints on what you need to look at, but then you still need to look at those. Uh, in 2017, we'll leverage query store for automatic plan regression, but it's still in cases where same, same query, uh, different, different changes that query store doesn't know what they are, it just collects whatever changes those are, but doesn't interpret them, and, and, and does something to, uh, to uh, freeze the previous plan for some time to see if it, if it, if it was the good choice there. Now to know why, then a, a DBA is still needed to explore the tools and to uh, explore the options the tools are giving away as possi possible hypotheses there. So that was a good question, thank you. Sure, question. And, oh, yes, another question there. So, uh, the UI is exploring the underlying DMVs, is that, if that is the question. Mm -hmm. So, is the question, uh, where do the weights from the to capture and crystal come from? No, no, absolutely, okay. So the question is, you ca capturing queries in uh, uh, weight stats in query store, do we still have them in the normal CDMOS uh, uh, weight stats? Yes, absolutely, you do. Uh, two different bits, we keep track. Of one more and then we need to go on, yes. It uses the DMVs. It uses, so here's the thing. Query store being a flight data recorder, it, it records data that you can look at, uh, uh, you can have a past view, right? Uh, on, on the performance of your queries as they uh, go throughout the system. The performance dashboard not only has visibility on in-flight requests, so it's a snapshot of what's running right now in this precise second, whereas query store, depending on the configuration, will accumulate data in memory and then flush to query store. So it's, uh, performance dashboard is an instantaneous view that, that even goes beyond uh, the queries, the requests that are running. You see the CPU, you see immediate weights, you see a, a number of other performance metrics that are uh, both from server-wide and query-related, whereas query store is query-related. Okay, so a little uh, different scope there. As a DBA, so, I might start with a troubleshooting performance dashboard. If somebody tells me my server is running slow, I would start with performance dashboard, identify or isolate. Is it the query or is it the server? Is it CX packet, is it blocking? But if then I can go in into query store and see how long has that been Once you identify the query. queries, you would go into the query store. Yeah. So uh, you, and you can, if you're doing troubleshooting on the side or if you open a support case, uh, you can even uh, clone the, the scheme of the database, but it will uh, take the, the query store with you and you can analyze and explore query store on the side. Um, and that, that's, that's also very powerful. And it also allows a smoother application upgrade. 
What do I mean by this? So our recommended upgrade uh, uh, method, if you will, revolves around you upgrade SQL Server to whatever is the latest bits you want to, in, to, to use. Uh, you move the databases there, but you keep the source database compatibility level. You then turn on Query Store with the right settings that you need to take care of in, in that you've, again, covered in that article. Uh, then you start to collect your workload. You create a baseline, whether it's already in production or if you're still in pretest and you run your workload to create that, that clean baseline, still in the previous compat level, still making sure that uh, for, from a cardinality estimation standpoint, you're using the rules uh, of, the, of the engine version that you came from, which is essentially what can drive uh, plan shape differences that then turn into uh, plan regressions. But then uh, after some time, after you feel that one or more business cycles have gone through your server, and you feel that, okay, uh, all my example workload has been captured by Query Store, you bump the compat level to the latest. Um, and then you will allow, uh, either if you're using uh, SQL Server 2017, it will automatically identify if there were planned regressions and for those specifically, move back for just for that query to the plan that used to work better until such time you have an opportunity to use other tools to analyze the differences and maybe enact changes that the query did itself to then make it work natively, if you will, uh, with, the, with the, uh, the new CE and other rules that we've implemented. Uh, or if you're in 2016, it will still allow you to, see, exploring the UI, see what queries have regressed, and in a click of a button, freeze the previous known good plan and use that. So this is the recommended upgrade method because leveraging Query Store, you don't need to guess. You can see what has regressed. There's a specific report for what has regressed. And you can, in literally two clicks, fix the, the problem with specific queries that you've seen there. An example of more powerful insights that we've unlocked in the tools also stem from what we added to, uh, to the engine uh, in terms of data collection and, and, and exposing that data. One of which is uh, the latest in SQL 2017. We've uh, exposed statistics information in ShowPlan. So SQL Server for the, uses uh, building blocks for performance are statistic objects. They keep metadata on the data distribution on the underlying tables. We really can't scan the tables before optimizing a query. We need to rely on the quality of that metadata. Now, if they need to be updated and with a sufficient uh, sample of the source table, if you will, to accurately portray the data distribution. And with that, SQL Server can then do its job better by uh, being able to uh, predict what uh, type of reads, let's say six scans and other operations would run through the plan to get you your data set. Now, that, those building blocks called statistics are loaded when we compile a query. And before, we didn't expose that. It may be interesting for you as a DBA to know that I'm looking at two queries, one is much worse than the other or has gone increasingly uh, slower with time. And at a certain point in time I go in, I look at the compiled plan and I want to see Hey, what is wrong with this? Now I know that, knowing that statistics are the building blocks for uh, how the uh, optimizer builds plans, now I can, take, I can uh, see some insights there. For example, I can see the modification counter. If I have a high modification counter, and maybe the date, the last date that the, the statistics were updated, which is also in line there, is long ago, maybe I need to manually update statistics. And with that, that will trigger recompile of the plan, and uh, maybe one of the causes that you are seeing a, a, a slowdown, a different performance, is because uh, the underlying data distribution changed, but the statistics don't reflect that. They are out of date. So therefore, you can act on that insight you get just by looking at the plans that, again, are in Query Store, because this is part of the, the plans that are captured by Query Store, or by using several tools that you can go directly to the cache and grab a plan from there. So it's, it's readily available. Yes, question there. What, what does uh, statistics from a different version means? Hmm? Sure. There's, so, they, they would, if they, they were up to date in SQL 2012 just before you, you move the database, they will work as is in SQL 16, 17, whatever. Um, 
We will use the information that was there. We'll use the same mechanism, where, whether it was in back in 2012 or now in 2017, to understand if statistics are, stall, uh, are, are stalled. And if you, are, uh, if you have enabled auto update statistics, for example, those will kick in. So that scenario that you mentioned does, can, does not, uh, it's not a, a root cause per se, just because I upgraded statistics are not usable. Okay? Those, those carry on with the database as it moves to a new version. Okay, so a very quick demo on this, and I need to pick up the pace here. Um, a very quick demo on, on uh, uh, what we, how we can quickly identify and, and do something about, about statistics here. So um, I have a store procedure, and you might recognize this as a um, uh, uh, run-of-the-mill uh, parameter sniffing issue in the end. I have a store procedure here uh, that I execute as part of my workload, right? So I execute with a certain uh, parameter here, input parameter. I want to see customer by status zero, okay? And I get a, a, an output. And looking at, the, uh, looking at the plan here, I see that the index seek has, excuse me, let me just uh, move here, yes. We can see that um, while the uh, estimated number of rows was 18,000, the actual number of rows were just 100. Okay, so quite a big difference here. Um, this, is the, this is one of the first insights that, um, that you need to, to take a look at when you open a, a, an execution plan. It's to look for, and by the way, this plan analysis tool in Better English SMS does this for you, points you directly to where you see the bigger differences between estimated, estimated rows and actual rows, because that's where you want to act. That's why you want to maybe improve uh, estimations by updating statistics or creating a better index for my predicate, for example. Um, so I see, I observe this, um, this scenario here. And uh, what I can do, so I have a, a large skew here. And the, 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 the difference uh, in these estimations comes from the little thing called statistics I just mentioned. So what we can do is we can go into the plan and in this case, I've ran the query manually uh, and, and gotten the plan, but I could have done just this, for example, which is to grab the estimated plan without executing it, or actually go to, um, or actually go to query store and see this information there. The point is, it's, a, it's not a runtime uh, operation. We are loading statistics as we compile the query, so this is already in the cache. That's what I've done. I've now collect, not collected the actual plan, but the estimated. And what I can see here is in the root node of the query, I have a number of useful information, uh, one of which uh, being optimizer stats usage. So which statistics were loaded by the optimizer, which then made him decide the way he did around what operators to use and whatnot. I can see immediately here that the modification counter is 19,000. It has 100% sampling rate, so that's, that's good, that means that I, the, this statistic accurately portrays 100% of the uh, underlying table in terms of data distribution. I do see modification counter is high, uh, or at least it's, it's, it's a high number. I don't know what, what this represents because at this point in time, I don't know the cardinality of the table, meaning I don't know how many rows the table has. So I, don't, I know there's a number here, it's not zero, uh, but I don't know if it's, uh, what does it represent as it relates to my table. So what I can do is, I do know what table it is, right? So um, I can quickly actually go to my uh, table uh, and understand how many rows that table has. So it's customer status. So I can go into, uh, what is that? Customers, customers here. Table customer status, what is that? I lost it. Oh, it's DBO, thank you, okay. And I can even visually, go to the properties, and um, as it opens, I can see here, let me let it open, I can see here that the table has uh, 19,000 rows. So the table has 19,000 rows, the modification counter is 19,000, so that means that maybe the table has changed entirely and I don't even know, uh, may not even have an accurate uh, portrayal of the underlying data distribution. So what do I do next? I now have this information that I've derived even from the uh, compiled plan, from the uh, estimated plan. So what I can do is um, I can go in and, and update the statistic. 
But besides using these visual tools, there are other artifacts I may take advantage of. I can uh, write my own scripts to do this analysis for me. For example, <clears throat> in this case, I'm using one of the new DMVs we've enabled, CISDMDB stats histogram, that what it does is, the same, is uh, uh, output the histogram uh, that relates to that uh, stat name, which is the same as the index here. So if I do this, what I see is that um, looking at the histogram for the range key zero, remember zero was my input parameter, right? So I want to see in that histogram where does the value zero uh, is coming from. So that's why I have where range high key equals zero. And then I see that it's the first step. Um, and I have uh, 18,000 rows that are equal to value zero, but still it estimated 100, remember? So there's something quite wrong here. I'm looking at all the, I'm getting all these uh, insights without running the actual query. So um, if, we, if we can update statistics, let's say with full scan, because before it was already with 100% uh, um, sample, it's 19,000 rows, it's not that big of a table, I will update with full scan, and once I again get, even if it's just the, um, the estimated plan, so the compiled plan, uh, for the next execution what happens is uh, SQL Server will understand that he needs to recompile this query, and in this case, oh, sorry, let me, okay. And, oh, come on, oh, I know why. It's live zoom instead of static zoom. This is what I wanted. So now, not only did I, would I get the 100 rows as I've seen in the actual plan, but now I'm estimating the 100 rows that I will get. So, I could derive the insight that my statistics were out of date by looking at either visually in, the, in, the, in SSMS or going through some uh, artifacts in terms of scripting and understand how to improve estimations uh, in this query. Okay, let's go back. And uh, moving to uh, server-related diagnostics. Uh, very quickly, though, the way we've always done it is to collect a number of these artifacts. Maybe look at error log files, maybe look at perfmon. We ran dbcc commands, uh, we, we hit IO spikes, we have a number of potential problems that hit our SQL servers. And we've done it that way, but now we have a number of uh, other enhancements that will facilitate the use of SQL Server will make your life easier as production DBAs, as users of SQL Server platform. Uh, indirect checkpoint, that's something that we've done a lot of enhancements that Parikshit will talk about in just, just in a minute. Um, we've added a number of new DMVs. You've just seen that one that outputs programmatically the statistics histogram. So there's no need for, has anyone before dumped to a table DBCC show statistics? One person, two, per two people, okay. And now, uh, and then you would dump to a table and then you would need to query the table. Well, not anymore. You can look at the histograms in line uh, and embed that into your troubleshooting scripts if you have those to just uh, derive insights uh, dire directly from there. Uh, but for example, auto temp DB configuration at setup time, that's something we've done already in SQL 2016 and we've enhanced with the setup in SQL 2017. TempDB being one of the, being a global resource and very, let's say, prone to or, or uh, sensitive to how the way you're using SQL Server, out of the box it's, it's uh, configured in a way that will withstand most scenarios. Out, uh, and we also know Linux, by the way. We now have, with SQL 2017, we have artifacts that can, uh, you can see performance aspects of Linux itself inside SQL Server. And so the new world means that I'm now using extended events. There's nothing you can trace, basically. And we, even in SSMS, we now, with 17.2, if you notice at the end, we now have an X event profiler that does basically the same thing you were accustomed to in, uh, in a SQL profiler. And there's an ongoing diagnostic collection. We've talked a little bit about the query store, and now it's a, it's a, a black, box, black box recorder, a, a flight recorder of sorts. And stuff that you used to do with the BCC commands, like for example, the BCC source statistics, or the BCC input buffer that to, co to collect the, the um, statement that was running at the time. Now you do it with the MVs, with controlled objects that you can programmatically use in line. Uh, the BCC, ex uh, uh, sorry, CDM uh, exec input buffer, or CDM, ex uh, uh, the stats histogram. So we are, we are turning, let's, let's leave the BCC commands to, uh, to actually doing consistency checking and, and move away of the BCC commands for uh, other types of, of uses. 
And we've talked about TempDB autoconfig. We've also added a number of insights into, into TempDB that Parikshit is going to talk about. And finally, dynamic resource usage. In back in 2016, and then we've improved in 2017, you have better memory response for, we, we have a feature called dynamic partition memory objects, which will, depending on the size of the memory that your queries require, they would, they would need to go through a gated system in order to access memory. There's a full blog post that my colleague Ajay has done on that. Uh, and now we've automated that, so that means that uh, you don't have to, to worry about uh, how do I configure SQL Server to a flag X, Y, or Z in order to accommodate uh, influx of different uh, types of queries requiring different quantities of memory? It's dynamically uh, allocated and escalated for you. And smoother I.O. with, again, with some enhancements that Parix is going to talk about. And one right. of those being indirect checkpoint. All right, let's talk about indirect checkpoint. So as a DBA, you might have heard about indirect checkpoint for predictable recovery time, right? Uh, we introduced it in SQL 2012, wherein if you want your database to recover within the specific time in seconds or minute, uh, you use indirect, check, uh, indirect checkpoint. But behind the scene, indirect checkpoint is much more than uh, just a predictable recovery time. Uh, we introduced new heuristics, the way we manage and track dirty buffers in buffer pool. And I'm gonna show you that why it is important uh, to turn on indirect checkpoint on large RAM systems, even when the, you're not looking for predictable recovery. That even that, that is not the goal. And that is one of the reasons we also made it as a default in SQL Server 2016. So in SQL Server 2016, in model database, your default, uh, by default, indirect checkpoint is turned on with a target recovery time of 60 seconds, which is within a minute. Which means every new database you create you will inherit those settings. And there is a reason why we did that. And it's not just about predictable recovery time, but because we have better heuristics with indirect checkpoint, uh, which we have turned on uh, to track dirty buffers. So let's, let's look at the previous algorithm, which we, what we call it as automatic checkpoint algorithm. And then let's contrast with the, the new indirect checkpoint algorithm. So with automatic checkpoint algorithm, and I'm looking at it from the perspective of tracking dirty buffers in buffer pool. So if so, I'm running SQL 2008, this is what I'm seeing, or SQL 2012? See, yes, this okay. is what you see. Even in 2016, if you don't turn on indirect checkpoint, this is what you would see. Okay. So your dirty buffers in SQL Server uh, are tracked by something called as buffer array. Uh, so because if I want to quickly identify what are the number, number of dirty buffers during the checkpoint, rather than scanning the entire buffer pool, I, I'm maintaining an array by which I can go and track through uh, and, and scan that particular array when I want to do perform checkpoint. Sorry, Parik, what are dirty buffers again? Dirty buffers are pa pages which are modified but not yet uh, persisted to the disk. That is what dirty buffers is, right? So, and but one of the challenge in automatic checkpoint is the dirty the buffer array doesn't have any context of the database, which means if you are having a, a checkpoint on, let's say, master database, I still have to scan entire buffer pool which for the entire instance. Now, this is still not a challenge if you're running on a low hardware, like uh, till when I, when I mean low hardware, maybe less than 64 GB, or a decade ago when servers were less than 64 GB in size, scanning the buffer array is still fast enough for you to not even notice. But the challenge comes in now when you move to terabytes of servers, wherein even though your database is small, if, even if your system database, master database is few MB, if I have to scan the entire buffer pool or buffer array, I'm, I'm spending a lot of time spending uh, on, on scanning just the buffer pool for the dirty buffers for, for one database. So what changed or what change which we brought with dirty uh, indirect checkpoint? So, and, and this is also one of the reason wherein when you encounter some issues, and rather than upgrading SQL Server, you might choose, you're running a SQL 2008 box, you might choose to upgrade the hardware but not upgrade SQL Server, you might end up seeing more problems because you don't have indirect checkpoint turned on. So the customers were like, okay, let's throw more hardware at the problem, let's not upgrade SQL application stack, and then you start seeing more issues when you upgrade with the lower, soft, lower version of the software. So what you're saying is that even though I'm using, let's say, SQL 2012, I have a 
uh, 500 gigabyte server, but now I need to upgrade one terabyte. I might see problems backing up because of that. That's that's right. Wow. With with automatic checkpoint. I, I know there is question. I'll I, I I'm running out of time, but I'll follow up in, in case yeah, because we are running short on time. With indirect checkpoint, what we do is we every time a, a page gets dirtied, we capture the dirty page context, which has the context of the database, and Further, we partition our dirty page list by schedulers. So if, and again, this is a question for all of you guys here. Whenever you have a large table and scanning or maintaining that table is a problem, what, what options do you have normally? Part, partition it, exactly. We did the same thing with arrays as well. For the buff array, we partition it kind of by database and by scheduler. So every dirty buffer is now maintained by scheduler. And the, the advantage for this is now when you create a database or when we do a checkpoint, we have decoupled ourselves from the size of the RAM. We, we know exactly which pages are dirty for a given database. So when you're taking a backup or when you're creating a new database, we are actually, actually know which pages are dirty for, from that. So this is the new heuristics which we have added. And that's the reason we also made it at default in 2016, because we know with now onwards, you will not have GBs of server. We are talking about terabytes of server, which is very common these days. So to give you some stats, for four terabyte RAM, we have to scan around 500 million buffers. Even if you're just creating a database, you would see, you would, and it, the size of the database may be irrelevant. Maybe you have your instant file initialization turned on. So at the storage level, the data file is created very quickly but the scanning of the buffer itself takes a lot of time. But with indirect checkpoint turned on by default, we would only scan like 250 bu buffers as opposed to 500 million buffers with four terabyte RAM system. So that's one uh, example of how we are building the new heuristics and using it ourselves to give you a, a, a better solution. So let's drill down more on indirect checkpoint and how indirect checkpoint works. We have something called as a background recovery writer thread which is constantly doing a dirty page pull. And the way it works is it will, it will constantly monitor based on your target recovery time. It internally tracks the dirty pages which it can afford to have. And the moment you cross that dirty page threshold, our algorithm will start scanning DP list or dirty page puffer list. We start with scanning the largest list from the scheduler because we know all the worker threads are working on scheduler, so there is one list per scheduler. So the one, the, the list which is the longest, we start from there, right? Uh, then we start collecting the page ID under a spin lock. We sort those pages, because when you're writing those pages, it, it is much more optimal and efficient when you have pages which are in the same vicinity to write them, to optimize the IO. And then we write those pages, and so, as, as the, the job of the recovery writer is to scan the largest DP list, and in the sizes of 128 batches of pages, we, we put them in the right queue, and from there, there is an IO completion routine per scheduler, which will do a gather write to write those pages and flush them to disk, right? So this is overall how we operate. And once the IOC thread has completed the writes, we would, the IOC thread also need to go ahead and update the DP list that these dirty pages I have persisted to disk, and now you can remove it from the dirty page buffer or dirty page list. So it also does that under a spin lock. Now, one of the reasons for me to go, get into the details of this algorithm is uh, there is some challenge which you might encounter when you have a skewed distribution of the database buffer list. What, what do I mean by skewed distribution? Now, when you have a batch kind of a workload, now you have few threads across your CPU. Let's say your 64 CPU machine or whatever uh, your CPU size is. You, you have a batch workload wherein you have few threads which is doing a lot of activity, which means those dirty page list becomes longer and longer. And then the background recovery thread is focusing on those lists. The IO completion thread is also focusing on the same list and both of them are contending for each other and conflicting for spin lock because the one guy has to clean it up and the other guy needs to flush them. And in the process, when because uh, it's a recovery interval, we need to honor your target recovery interval. If your background recovery writer thread starts lagging, 
We, we have a new routine called recovery writer helper, which means all the worker threads which are running on other CPUs will also start helping recovery writer to push them here. Now the challenge is this exacerbates the situation. You have all the worker threads trying to work on the same list under a spin lock, and you would start seeing challenge uh, and spin lock contention with this particular issue. So, so we are trying to just honor the configuration that each DBA has set on the database level for recovery interval. That's right, and even our defaults in 2016. So we are trying to honor the target recovery interval of 60 seconds uh, and, and, and try to fight if uh, we are lagging behind that we may not be able to make it for that 60 second. The recovery writer is being held by all the right helpers here as well. And then it kind of exacerbates the situation with all the spin lock contention in place. So in 2017, uh, the way we did this, now we turned this on for tempdb as well, because tempdb, uh, although uh, you, you don't have recovery goals for tempdb, right? There is no point to have a target recovery interval for tempdb, but tempdb still inherits the properties from model. So tempdb, by virtue of that, will inherit your indirect checkpoint algorithm as well. What we did is, is we limited the helper thread for tempdb that elevates the problem of your spin lock contention uh, by, by a lot. And further, we have currently turned on a knob for you guys if you feel that, hey, there is a lot of DP list contention. The reason I'm talking tempdb is in any SQL instance you pick up, your most IO intensive workload is tempdb. Uh, whether knowingly or unknowingly, or you would see your workload, your spills, your temp tables, your caching, Everything happens on tempdb. So uh, your tempdb will have the highest IO workload. So you would see this problem, which I just uh, illustrated of the uh, DP list contention or spin lock contention, you would see that in tempdb. And to solve that problem in 2017, we changed that. And if you see the difference in our TPCCH benchmark, the transactions per second in 2016, which for the same workload, which were 12,000, it improved to 20,000. So we did this in 2017. We are bringing this change back. In, in fact, in SP1 CU5, uh, in 2016, SP1 CU5, this change is already out. Uh, and further, in S SQL 2016, SP2 also, this will be part of that as well, which is coming soon. So again, this is all about indirect checkpoint. Now let's see how did we use the indirect checkpoint algorithm to make our backups faster in 2017. So this is how your backups operate, and I'm I'm, I'm giving you a very brief overview of the steps we perform during a backup. Whenever your full database backup starts, at some point in time after, and I've skipped a few steps, for some, after some time we clear the differential bitmap, right? You guys are familiar with differential bitmap. For differential backups, we maintain a bitmap in database. So every time you take a full database backup, we clear that so that you are, we can track those differential pages. Now, before, before we can clear the differential bitmap, what we do is we have to iterate through the buffer pool to drain out all the pages which might be modified in the dirty buffers before, because I want to persist that, them on the disk before I can go ahead and clear those bitmaps. So I, I go through the bpool iteration, then I perform the checkpoint which will ensure all the dirty buffers are persisted to disk, and then we clear the differential bitmap after that process. Then we establish a backup LSN, disable the truncation of the T-log, while, even while taking a full database backup, because I want to make sure I give you a consistent copy of the database when you restore. So I disable log truncation for some point in time during the backup process. And then I establish a backup sync object, which tracks the dirty buffers going forward. Because as I am copying the data, and you might have terabytes of data, there might be new changes which might be happening. So I need to track those pages also. So, but be between the time of last checkpoint and the backup sync object, there might be a few other dirty buffers which might have been unaccounted. So we have another round of buffer pool iteration, uh, which, which wherein we wait for draining all the, the IOs, and then backup sync object will take care of all the future IOs. And then we actually do a data copy at the storage layer to create a backup, uh, end lesson, and backup, uh, the backup ends there. This is the entire workflow here. Now, if you see the size of my arrows, it is representative of, for small databases, 
you might, when I say small database, let's say take master database for an example, you might end up spending more time in iterating through the buffer pool rather than the actual data copy process. Let's say your database is a few MB or few GB in size, but you have terabytes of RAM, you would see you spend more time in your, uh, your buffer pool iterations than actually your data copy. And this is where, again, we use the indirect checkpoint heuristics which we have, because indirect checkpoint keeps track of all the dirty buffers for a given database. So we already know ahead in time what pages are dirty. We reuse that, and in 2017, we have eliminated this, eliminated this, and that reduces your backup time significantly. Uh, to give you some stats about uh, how the backup performs uh, uh, with indirect checkpoint turned on, this is your backup performance results in SQL Server 2017. And if you see, your most improvement are for small databases. And this is very common in consolidation scenario wherein you have large SQL instances and you consolidate small databases there. You might have few uh, GBs of data which will show 100x improvement. And as the database size grows, you might, the improvement, uh, 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 the, the, in, uh, the performance gain decreases because the data copy takes a lot of time there. So that's the reason you would see this kind of performance trend. So this is uh, what you would see or what you can expect in 2017. The next change which we had is smart differential backup. Now, most customers would take differential backup for very large databases to save time and to save storage. So normally your backup plan would look like uh, you would take full database backup on every Sunday, and then you would want to take differential backups on every weekday. The challenge sometimes, what, what happens, uh, uh, what you may encounter is, on Monday you had 10% of the change or pages change, and differential backup is a cumulative backup, it's not incremental. So you, you are 10% changes, so you will have a small backup, uh, you, it serves the purpose for which you had a differential backup. Tuesday you had 40% of the changes, and you would still not see, and you will still gain from differential backup. Let's say on Wednesday you have 80% of the pages on the database changed. That means the size of the differential backup and the time it takes to differential backup is same as full database backup. You're not gaining anything from differential backup. It's pretty much similar to full database backup. By Thursday, Friday, you would see a differential backup uh, in terms of storage and time similar to what you have in full database backup. The challenge is you have restore change too long and it is impacting your RTO. And further, you are also uh, uh, having more storage size also. So now we exposed the new, uh, new column in an existing DMB, so the DMDB file space usage called modified extent page count. You can use this to track the pages changed per data file and further aggregate it by database to find out percent change uh, uh, of pages per database. And now in your backup, you can make a dynamic algorithm that if my database page has changed more than 50% rather than taking a differential backup. Let's take a full database backup because then I would make it more smarter. And you will see the change as on Sunday you take a full database backup. Again, this pattern remains the same. On Wednesday, rather than taking a differential backup, your script will take full database backup. The advantage is all the following days, you will again gain on the, the time and the storage from the differential backup, because you, in the previous scenario, you would be taking full differential backup. You, it didn't add the intelligence of the pages or the changes in your database. Now, in your scripts, you can add that intelligence from this particular column, and you would see that by Friday and, and Saturday, you would still be continuing with differential backup. With the new algorithm, you can have faster restore, because if your database crashes for any reason on weekend, you can take a full database backup from Wednesday and restore it there rather than waiting on, on, on Sunday. So, and storage savings as well with this new algorithm. Smart transaction log backup. Again, let's understand the, the, the challenge first. Most DBAs with full recovery model for your production database will always have an algorithm of 15, minute, 15 minutes default uh, 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 transaction log backups, right? Now, let's say if the changes in the transaction log at nine o'clock is very minimal, you would still take a backup. It's a time-based backup. You, your algorithm doesn't take into account for the transactional activity on the, on the server. So let's say at 9.15 you had moderate activity, you would still take a backup. Now at 9.30, between 9.15 and 9.30, there was a huge transaction burst. Somebody ran a batch load. Now between this time, your active log cannot be truncated because it was not being backed up. What happens in this scenario? 
auto grow. Yeah. So you will see an auto grow because your active log exceeded the total log file size. You will see an auto grow. And you would see a similar pattern if there is another transaction would burst. You will see another auto grow. Now, from a DBA perspective, you're doing all the right things. You have a, a T log backup job, which is taking backups at, the, at a particular schedule. So you're doing all the right things. But because your script doesn't have the intelligence of the transactional activity on the server, you, you cannot take the backup when you actually have to, to avoid auto grows, VLF fragmentation, and all the other challenges. So your current challenge is the algorithm is not adaptive, frequent uh, auto grows, VLF fragmentation, and inconsistent backup size. With smart lock backup, so we have introduced in 2017 a new DMF, uh, sys.dmdb lock stats. Uh, and one of the reason we introduced it as a DMF is coming from a feedback. And I would, since Glenn is also here, I would call his name. So it is important, if it makes sense to have a DMF to cross apply across the instance, which will allow you to more programmatize it. If I were to make it as a DMV, you have to use database, switch the context, and have it as a database under the database. So it, you will have to run it. So if you are monitoring large server instance, it just makes sense to use a cross apply there. So with the new algorithm, what you'll see is whenever you can keep a threshold of, based on the active backup size, you can keep a threshold whenever my active log exceeds a particular value, which might be 80% of your log size, you would want to take a full uh, a T log backup automatically. So you will, your active log will never exceed your T log size. Your backups will be consistent. And what you will see is you will have minimal auto grows, no VLF fragmentation, and consistent backup size. And let me also illustrate the same with the, with the demo. So if you can bear with us five minutes after the hour, we would appreciate, but feel free to leave it at any time. Uh, yeah, yes, uh, better, yeah. All right. So let me quickly run my scripts. I'm creating a sample database here. I'll start my backup job, and this is to show you the scenario what happens today. With your scheduled backup, I'm taking backup every one minute, which normally you would have it for 15 minutes or whatever schedule you identify. You would take a backup periodically. Now, I have this Power BI dashboard, which is developed using the new DMF, which I just showed you. This, this, all the fields from this is pretty much coming from the same uh, DMF, uh, which I showed you. And if I just were to refresh this, what I'll do is I will also start the workload in the interest of time. So now I'm starting a workload. Uh, this, if you see here, the fields of interest would be, let's see the total log size, which is 80, M, uh, 80 MB. We had an eight VLF count size, and this is the new uh, information which we have exposed log since last log backup, which will tell you the active log since the last backup uh, to, to help you know what are the things. I'll take questions afterwards because we are running out of time, but I'll, we'll be here around so for any questions. So now, what I, if you see the transactional activity, I'm generating, generating some random workload. Let me do a refresh here. And we are taking backups every one minute in this scenario. Now, what you saw here is quickly, uh, because you were waiting on a time, that means you, I would take a backup only after a minute. Within that time, there was a burst of workload. You saw there was an auto grow. You saw the VLF count increased. You clearly see here active workload and the total VLF size had increased at that point in time. And, and if I continue to refresh, you might see a similar behavior or pattern. With, with the schedule, because your backup algorithm doesn't have any knowledge about the transactional activity. So that's a challenge which you will see here. So let me quickly switch to a different algorithm. Let me stop this. Let me stop my workload. Let me do a refresh of the database. So we reset it back to ATMB, what we had earlier. Let me start my smart backup algorithm. And the smart backup algorithm, here I'm using a 50 MB size. So the moment my active log exceeds 50 MB, I would want the backup to execute. So if you see here, more than 50 MB, just make sure you take a backup. So let's do, or let me start the workload as well. And let me start the workload. Okay, it started. 
let's refresh the dashboard to see. So again, we are reset back to uh, 80 MB. Now, if you see here closely, the moment the trans there was a transactional burst of activity, we took backup at the 50 MB threshold. So this is your backup size. And if you see here, we never aut we had, had an auto grow. Our backup size was always consistent to 80 MB, 8 VLF count. And we continue to do that. If you see here, we constantly maintain the same 50 MB backup size, no auto grows, no VLF fragmentation issues. This is how you can build intelligent algorithm as a DBA uh, using the diagnostics which we have. Again, I'll do a quick refresh again, just to show you that it, the algorithm will continue to have 50 MB backups with no auto grow, right? And there is a workload which is already running and which might have more bursts of activity. All right, quick. We are two minutes away from being done. Right. Thank you for. Uh, yeah. So one 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 more diagnostic information is TempDB Insights. So uh, in 2017. One of the common challenge with, with you as a DBA would see is, who is taking my TempDB usage? I mean, who is, I, I see my TempDB growing, but I don't have any information about what is taking it. So we have added a new DMV for, to track your version store usage uh, across the instance. So you can build some uh, reports of this, like a heat map, which will tell you what is your version store usage per TempDB, which will allow you to do some capacity planning as well. So that's the DMV information. And, and this is just the start. We will further continue to invest in the TempDB Insights area because we know it's a common problem or challenge for, uh, for customers. And I'll allow Pedro to talk more about what we are doing next. So last, uh, last, last uh, piece of the session is what, what's next still for 2017. So as you know, we will now be releasing for the first year monthly cumulative updates. Um, some of the things that are coming shortly will be, for example, in terms of parallelism, um, and, we, and I've demonstrated this uh, a couple of days ago, we have a new weight type for parallelism, which means that uh, we'll now be able to be more concise more, uh, and drive a more specific action when you see parallelism weights. There are parallelism weights that you can act upon, others that cannot. They were all amalgamated under CX packet. We've split those. And, uh, and uh, you, ca you can see that in the session from, from Monday from Wednesday, sorry. In terms of statistics, um, we'll now, uh, we'll allow you to influence the way that statistics creation and update use parallelism. That's also coming for 2017. Or uh, more accurate auto statistics update for incremental stats, which has been uh, a pain in some scenarios. Uh, for example, for resource governance, we'll allow you to actually hard limit the query execution times. So if the, if the query execution time is exceeded from what you, DBA, has set for a specific resource pool, then we actually hard stop the query and roll back. Uh, or for TempDB, for example, spill information uh, will be available under different DEX events and, and DMVs. So you'll be able to have more precise information on the scope of TempDB of what spilled and, and where it came from. So I will just leave you with some bookmarks uh, that may be useful. For example, dashboards that we've talked about will be shared in the Tiger Toolbox GitHub, for example. We have several tools there that you may want to take advantage of or, or uh, reads uh, maybe for the trip back home. Um, and well, thank you for your time. And uh, please develop, oh, submit your thank evaluations. You.